All right. So again, welcome everyone. So this one is um, a first time where we do a, a deep dive in certain topics as part of the GSMA drone interest group. So here we have uh, the, um, um, the sessions that um, please we will see here the speakers. So I'm very honored to have two great speakers, Elkalina Vatnen from uh, Ericsson, but we'll talk about 3GPP and Francesca Stockton from Verizon, where we'll talk about their experience on supporting um, US. Uh, myself, I'm Barbara Pareglio, so I'm the Executive Director of the Connectivity for Aviations, or nowadays we call it Advanced Air Mobility in GSMA. So we look at different aspects of how to support uh, drones um, with the cellular network. So before we start, and we go in the presentations. I have some housekeeping for all of you. So, and here's the agenda. As I mentioned before, we will have two interventions and there will be Q&A. So you have the time to ask all your questions and then we'll be closing um, at five o'clock UK time. So in about um, two hours that. Housekeeping. So please, um, if you're not uh, presenting, because it will be too noisy, I will ask you if you can also mute yourself. Uh, only the presenters will be activating the microphone. And also because of maybe there will be a lot of people I suggest that if you're not presenting to have your camera off. And the Q&A, there will be a sessions on the Q&A. So you can put your questions on the Q&A. So I will highlight it there. And you also have the chat, but the chat I will just say, please don't use it for questions. So at least we have all the questions listed in um, in one section. So this is as a housekeeping, so it's very, very simple. But if you, if you have any supports or things that you need, please put it in the chat, we will support you. But for any questions, please put it in the Q&A. So before we start, I just want to give a brief introduction of what GSMA is. For our, who of you that doesn't know what GSMA is, is uh, an, an association, an industry association, which represents the mobile industry. And in this particular instance, we, we look at from the perspective of uh, supporting the uh, advanced mobility. So we look at how the telco industry can help to achieve the scale for commercial availability and sustainability of commercial operation of drones. How we do it, I'm not going to go into detail, so I do get uh, We have two groups, very active. One is the drone interest group, which is this group that is spin off this, uh, this section. And the other one is called IRA Connectivity Joint Activity. In here, we have a cooperation and collaboration with the Global UTM Associations, which is an association like us, but from the aviation. We work together to uh, effectively uh, talk about how to use cellular connectivity and services from the mobile operator network to support the advancement in the um, uh, traffic management, but also in supporting the connectivity for drugs. Again, there's a lot of other groups here that uh, uh, we have in GSMA that they support another activity, they support all these uh, driving forces for helping um, understanding and also leveraging the, the networks for drones. The other things that I would just want to highlight, there's a lot of resources on our website um, that you can find case study uh, with the different uh, mobile operators in the world. There's a lot of useful white paper uh, for you to have a look if you want to get more in depth, uh, and also web talks like this one, which are available for you to get more information. I want to stop it right here, and I want to give the floor to Alkalina. Uh, Alkalina, uh, I think you are online. I saw you. Um, if you I want, I can give the control to you. Or okay. let me let me see. Yeah. Or maybe I can even request control. Uh, I think you. No, you no okay. I can't. You are one of the presenters who should be able to. Are you able to to take no. it? I don't. I can't. No. Okay. No. 
Don't you worry. So if you want, just tell me when to move slides and I do okay. it. Okay, okay. I'll do it that way. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Helga Lina Mättänen. I work with Ericsson Finland and I'm a Run2 delegate. I have been Run2 delegate now eight years. And before that, I was for a while in Run1 and my background is in, in Run1, the physical layer. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Barbara, are you able to switch the slides? Oh, is it me actually? No. Okay, so the uh, outline of this presentation is short. Um, most content is about the 3 GPP activities, and what has happened in the standard in, in, in earlier releases, and what will happen in, in the next release 18. And then we have shortly as Ericsson view and question and answer. Next slide, please. Okay, so the 3 GPP activity started already in 2017 when a study item was concluded and it concluded with the view that LTE networks that was the topic then are, are capable of serving area duties. There was actually a several simulations but also field study so actual measurements and that's that's not typical for 3 GPP so it, it so 3 GPP really the companies really took it seriously to find out whether the LTE networks can, can serve the UEs or not. And even though the antennas are down tilted, there are side lobes that are actually serving, uh, giving the coverage also towards the sky. And this is, of course, really dependent on the scenario or the deployment and where it is being measured and studied. And I think most of the studies or most of the measurements have been done in rural areas not so much in city, but also there's the practical experience shows that it, it, it work, works also in the city. So the challenges was was um, that the network becomes so many way stations become very visible for the UE when, when the when the um, when the height of the UE increases. And that means that one UE can actually potentially interfere many base stations. But it was seen that when you when you have one or two UEs up there, it's fine. But when you start to have a lot of UEs, or when do you have or when you have some UEs that have a high up uplink traffic load, then that also might might become an issue. So and also also there's this um, so that's one reason why it's very important that the network knows when there's flying UEs and it's this interference control is, is one one of those practical reasons but the other reason comes from regulations that regulations also require in many countries that the network needs to know that the UE is actually authorized to use the network while flying and there's of all these safety concerns that 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 there is um, that the network can provide connectivity and the UEs can actually um, safely land and will only only uh, fly in areas where they are supposed to fly. And then after that study item, we we continued with the with the work item that was on LTE, though that happened already in release 15. And there we added some basic functionality, how the network can handle the drones. Although the connectivity and everything is, is in place, so you can put any UE actually on, on a drone and fly and you get the connectivity. But then we added some functionality to address the regulations and address more that how the network can better recognize a flying UE and how it could better um, serve, serve the mobility because the mobility is also a little bit challenged in, in the sky when, when the coverage area of those side lobes is actually smaller and it's, it's a lot more scattered the coverage map on the sky that it is on the, on the ground where the uh, coverage is actually optimized for. 
and then there has been after release 15 there has been in all beginning of all releases there has been a suggestion to bring the same functionality also to nr to 5g but there has always been so much other work for 5g that drones has been dismissed in the very last moment even though there has been always support to bring this drone basic functionality also to nr but now finally in release 18 it, it has been accepted and it will start the work will start in in august okay next slide please so this uh, this is the requirements that are considered in in 3gpp this is what we it was done already in 2017 but in N for nr we are not going to repeat we are going to use the same so that's why it's it's included in this in this presentation so again we will consider that the drones have two types of traffic it's command and control and application data they have a bit different um, requirements command and control needs to be very reliable and application data you would need more bandwidth but all in all it's both user plane data and it's considered that that that, that the network just would be fast enough and if possible could also schedule uplink that much for the ue that it could even be streaming but there also the network it's up to the network to decide it would need to know that okay now we have a ue that is flying this flying status is recognized and then when the ue requests uh, reso uplink resources the network can then decide whether in that that situation it's good to it's okay to schedule schedule the ue or whether there's too much interference that's technically should it should be possible then the high target even though the the um there might be coverage a lot higher up but for example we had this height reporting what we have specified is we considered up to 300 meters so the values that can trigger the height report is up to 300 meters so so it's it doesn't show everywhere but it might show then in some places that okay 3gpp considers up to 300 meters and that was also the level where, where the, all these simulations and field trials were, were considered. And also there's this max speed. I don't know, this doesn't impact too much on this, um, what we actually specify, but this was just put down that we, co we consider this, this type of speed for, for the UEs. And I think those latency data rates I only mentioned and packet error rate, that's all related to what, what is co command and control and what is application data and, and one has higher error, error rate requirement and the other one like videos is quite low, but then you would like to have more bandwidth. Okay, next slide please. This is timeline for this release 18. So um, run to start first. Next August has, has the first meeting. And run to has also most of the time unit allocations. Most and most of the work. There's something in run one. And something in run three. But those are especially in run three. It's quite defined and it should not explode but in run one it never know what will happen they have very small time unit allocation that probably helps to keep it under control and it's su supposed to be well defined but we'll see i hope hope that it, it it is kept like that that there's not 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 so much um yeah, well, I'll, I'll go to the details where it could explode. But in run two, the most work is in run two, and I will go through later. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the, so first thing that is um, that is needed by the by the work item description and 
but also ha was already in LT was the biggest uh, demand for some op operators from countries where you have these strict regulations is that the drone needs to be authenticated and then and authorized and then in 3GPP because we don't uh, we cannot recognize a device we cannot have like a, that the network would know what kind of device is using it so network doesn't really know which on in this run signaling level what is your phone model or whether it's an iPad or something else so this run signaling is the same so what what run2 came up with in LT was that uh, the, you can authorize a subscription so the user can be authorized so it's a sim card based authorization and if you use that with some of those run capabilities and combine that information in the G node B then you can that's the best the best 3GPP way to recognize a UE as a drone so there was two I will go de to the details later but there was two uh, capability of the UAV that the, when the UAV connects to the network it will send the capability signaling and the GNOT B can check okay it has these two capabilities for two, two, two specific features that are considered to be drone features and then it can ask whether that when it asks the other subscription information it can also ask or it, it, it receives the information whether that subscription is actually authorized to operate as a drone in this network and if it is, then the network can, the implementation, take those uh, measures as it is supposed to, or it, for handling the, the drone the, during its connection, whether it's flying, recognize when it's flying, perhaps do some interference control, perhaps consider what to schedule an uplink, where to, where to hand over the drone, and that sort of decisions might be different. But that all depends on what has been implemented in the network. And this information, in every handover, you can forward this information to the next base station. And this is something that is going to be brought up in 5G now also. So there will be 5G core that will support this. So then actually it would, it would be so that both um, e node piece and G node piece, whether it's connected to EPC or whether it's connected to 5G core network, can can use the same throughout. But whether it's, it's dual connectivity based uh, NR connectivity or standalone NR, it would work then all the way. And then that's where this run three part is to have this signaling support. Okay, next slide, please. And then the other part is the information that the drone can provide to the network is this flight path. This flight path is something that the UTM can give to the drone, and it actually can give it to the drone via the G node B, but because it goes as the inside in the user plane information, the G node B doesn't know about it. So, so then this is the way to actually the G node be the run node to get uh, get this information from the UE. So that's why we had to specify this signaling from the UE to the G node B, even though the G node B might have actually already given this in, in this pipe. So this very simple way to do it in 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 the in LTE, that uh, G not be may request a flight path information, and UE, if it is ha has it available, it, it can give uh, waypoints in the report. The G not be might might tell, give me two or give me up to four, and and UE might give how many it has. It might give only one if it has only the target where it's going. It might give only that one. And there is currently for LTE, there is nothing um, that UE cannot tell anything for the 
network that now it has changed or it, it would be only up to the if, the if the network asks again and sees that it has changed. But this is something that we, we could change in, in NR. So it could be a bit more flexible and a bit more informative also during the connection. That if, if, if the drone has changed its uh, path. And then it's always the question, how is, how is this used? And it de completely depends what has been implemented in the network. It, it cannot be used directly as a for handover decision because the handover has to rely on the signal strength. That's more, more important than, than this, where the UE is going. And, and one reason is that the, actually the, the signal strength might, best signal strength can, might come from some far away base station that is completely off the flight, flight path. So maybe you would like to hand over there, or maybe you would not like to hand over there. Maybe you want to hand over some another base station that also is okay quality, but it's actually more towards more more in the in the direction where the drone is anyway going. So in that side of decisions, it, the flight path can help that it's not only based on the RSRP, but you could also see that okay, it's an RSRP from the cell that is actually towards the target destination of the drone. So it can help there, but you cannot only base it on, on this because it might be that the next base station doesn't have any any um, slopes or any 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 gain for that U in that moment. So you cannot hand, hand over to that base station, but it can help. It can, can be as, as input to those handover decisions. Okay, next slide. And this will be brought to NR. And here, uh, both of these measurement reporting enhancements, again, the same as what we had in LTE. This is to for two reasons. This to detect if the drone is interfering. And the other one is to detect if the drone is flying. Because the flying status is very hard to define. To have a good definition now, now is flying, now it is not flying because it might be hovering somewhere quite um, low. And from network perspective, that's not flying. It, it, it acts similar as a, as a ground UE on somebody's pocket. And again, you might have some uh, UEs high up, but they are not actually flying. It's just on some high building or just just above the base station height, but it's it's not flying. So if you combine these two, then it's it's easier to deduce whether the drone is actually flying. So the first first one is the height reporting. It's quite uh, simple to explain. Also, you have a you configure a threshold, for example, 50 meters, and then you can configure another threshold for example, uh, 200 meters, and every time the drone crosses it, goes up or down, it will send a report. It sends the height, and it can be configured to send also its location and, and speed. And the other one is a bit more uh, complicated to explain, but it is so that you have, when the drone measures the uh, signal strength from several base stations, and normally the triggering happens so that when, when one of those uh, signal strength from one base station exceeds a threshold or fulfills an event, it means that it has exceeded the threshold for a certain amount of time. So then the measurement result is triggered. But here you want to trigger the measurement result only when three, for example, three signal strengths are or have fulfilled the event at the same time. Not so that it has measured first one cell has fulfilled, then another one, and, and then later a third one, and it's not enough. You you need to you, you are actually maintaining a list in the in the UE that that uh, makes sure that this event triggers only when you have at the same time you have tri triggered 
three of those. So if you configure the more than three, like four or five, and 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 that even triggers, you can be quite sure that the UE is high up because the terrestrial UE would not see, for example, five base stations with that kind of signal strength. So you have to be this line of sight situation towards all those five base stations to, for this to trigger. So that is the idea of, of this one. But something to uh, say about this one is that because it demands these five base stations to trigger at the same time, it will need to also wait for the five to trigger. So it will be a bit late, delayed reporting compared to what do you need for mobility. So you need also the mobility results configured for the UE so that you get so you can do the handovers properly. So this is not for not for handovers. It's it's purely for this interference detection. Okay, thank you. Next slide. And then something new for NR potentially. It's it's still a study and specify or it's stated in the in this in this work item description as study and specify, which means it is not so definite as the what I had in the previous slides that it's already decided that we will specify that support, but this is more like study and specify. And the need comes from this rule by FAA, this remote ID broadcasting, which is already supported an unlicensed spectrum in Wi-Fi. And now it it is um, it's considered that it it might be brought in this license spectrum also so. 3GPP would actually specify it, but it's 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 a like this is also directly from the work item description that it is a placeholder, and it depends on what SA2 will conclude because they have also now started a study item on this matter, and because it's it's so pending on what SA2 will decide, it, it's very hard to say now anything what it will be exactly in run to. So it might be something for the PC5, that's the best guess, that PC5 is uh, changed in a way that the drone could broadcast ID info in one of those broadcast messages. So then um, network could read it, and also some public officer could read it directly from, from, from the drone. Or it could have this drone that he, the the public officer is is flying, and that could read other drones. But what what will be the technical uh, content of this in run two it, or run one? This is one of those items that if it goes too much in run one, it might explode V2X in in run one. That it they might start designing or new fancy things, but we'll see what happens. But this is, um, yeah. But because it's so dependent, this work on SA2, it's good that in run two, we have time unit allocation that is spread throughout the release. So we have in all meetings, some allocation for drones. So that enables that we can have Liaison exchange more easily with SA2. We can give them feedback. They can ask run two, what what do we think about some certain solutions? And we have some time to consider and then respond to SA2. And then they can take that into account in their in their study. And this is um, planned to be for both NR and LT. And this is because uh, in V2X this. Uh, LT base station and NR base station can cross configure LT and NR UEs, so it makes sense to make make this support from both. Then both LT and NR would have this support in case run to actually specifies. Okay, next slide, please. It's probably on the same. Yeah. What more can I say? Yeah, this slide is, is I, I just wonder, so the VID says that we, we can consider this um, 
even these non-3GPP GPP technologies and I unlicensed pass and as the baseline, so, so we, we should see what, what is exactly the solution in Wi-Fi. And I guess it's possible conclusion that we say that that will be enough, that we don't specify anything or in the UU, which is a 3GPP interface between the UE and the, and the base station or, or, or UE and another, another UE. But it's... Um, yeah, it, it's interesting where it will go. And, and then now it's also SA3 is involved. They are already sending liaisons between SA2 and SA3 that whether, whether you need some securing of this PC5 signaling. But what they are also considering is, is they are cons considering this detection and avoidance signaling between those drones. And that's something that is not included in this run work item. But if they conclude that this is needed, it might be added later. And this is again this PC5 V2X signaling that drones could detect their each other and, and they could avoid each other. And drones already have this Wi-Fi based, but whether it, it would be also in a license spectrum with 3GPP based solution. So then you would actually have a dedicated spectrum. You wouldn't have to rely that whether you whether you get a chance to send something if your unlicensed um, band is crowded. So it's a bit more reliable in 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 a licensed spectrum. Okay, next slide, please. And then there's um, well, the first one is the, about this. Just limiting the interference, really a, a run to detail. It's about this mobility triggering that if, if the drone takes off from the ground and might trigger these mobility reports uh, from each, each cell that it sees. And for, the, for, that, for the measurement event that I described earlier, this number of triggered, uh, number of cells triggering for that it has already been handled in, in 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 that specific procedure but it was not considered for these regular mobility events so this is something that might be added but it's really like run to specific detail that would need the, yeah some consideration and then uh, the other one that is 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 run one it's also related to these beams and it's related to this beam forming and beam management. You, some of you might know something on, on this complicated MIMO beam uh, NR SSB beam management DCI states and all, all this how how the how the UE can uh, without having any handovers it it is switched between these beams and. Most of those, and they might be even directional antenna from the UE side, but mo and most of that is targeted for for the FR2, but the drones are more on the FR1. So now it's it's about how to bring those capabilities also to FR1, and that hopefully is limited effort from run one side, but you never know. But yeah, okay, yeah. So then I collected a couple of other um, features that actually are, they are not part of the drone work item, but they are, they are something that the drones, drone operation would, could already or would already use. And the MIMO I, I mentioned already, then in the middle there's positioning, and there's actually been some liaison exchange between Etsy and, and RAN about this, uh, how how drone positioning has been taken into account because there's regulatory requirements for that and the positioning has been specified in a general sense so it has not been a drone positioning but it works for drones but there maybe at some point some drone specific enhancements are found that are needed it's possible but it is it's if you work on drones and the network positioning something that you you would like to 
know something about and, and follow also those developments. And the other one is this mobile uh, relay nodes. That if you have, uh, for example, a flying taxi, you might have this mobile relay there in the taxi, and then that could serve all the all the passengers on that pilot. But mobile IAB is specified as such. It's not specified as a drone necessarily, but you can apply it in a drone. And there again, you might need or might want to specify something specific for this use case, or it could work as such. And it also would require those experts to take a look and see whether there's anything needed. Okay. Yeah, then uh, shortly on this Ericsson view that um, Ericsson is quite positive to drones and believes that that cellular networks they they well very well positioned to serve the drones because they are already deployed all over the wor world and they would it would meet the regulatory requirements also these positioning items and even there's some um, vendor specific multi more specific positioning like Gerson also has as a service to really locate the UE or the drone in the network accurately. And then we have also been very quite active in, in 3GPP. We have been the rapporteur in study item, in the work item. Next work item, it will be Nokia, but we will be very supportive of that work. And we have contributed a lot of research on the next slide, there's uh, references. And we are working together with operators to make this a reliable rel at, at some point of time. It, it takes time because uh, all the PCs, also the rec regulatory requirements need to catch up. It's very slow to have that work. We need more, more support on the standard perspective, more understanding the vendor side, more understanding the operator side, what is really needed, what, what, what the network needs to actually do to support the drones that are flying in, in, in some of those different use cases that the operators might want to support. Next slide. And this is some references. And then, I don't know, I guess I'm over my time, but I don't know if there's questions. L let me have a look in the Q&A if there are any questions for you. I don't see any any questions, so. Either it was clear or. <laughs> or it was clear or nothing was clear, we don't know. Uh, but uh, I would suggest if you do still have uh, questions for uh, Kalina, please type it in. Let me check on the chat if maybe over there. Um, uh, actually, there are questions on the chat. So okay. <laughs> um, instead of the Q&A, but let me see because there's see quite a lot of conversation. Well. Barbara. Hi, Barbara, this is Stefan. I think I addressed most of the questions uh, uh, while uh, Elka was speaking okay. uh, as they were coming, trying to uh, uh, simplify. But the last one from Alexander, I think that's for uh, directly for Lina, Elka Lina. Okay. Uh, let me see the, the one. How can we get more information about the Ericsson Airspace coverage mapping? I think that one is the, the one that um, Alexander's uh, probably. Okay. I, I don't see the question, but. Um... You, you can, on the um, yes, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. so send me an email and, and I, I will direct you to the correct. Yeah, now I see the question. Yes, I will give, provide you more information and potentially a, a contact also. Yeah. Uh, let me see. There's something coming in. I don't know if it's a. What is the highest height of a drone reached? Uh, you mean uh, while connected? <laughs> I guess. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a different test. I think maybe Verizon can also give you some information what they did in the network. But um, I think uh, it's a few kilometers, even if if if, if, the, if it's like a very rural area and there's um, yeah, depends where you fly. 
Right, I'm going through if there may be anything that uh, I see that uh, Stephen has already answered most of them, which is good. But again, if you do have uh, more information, uh, please feel free. Uh, uh, there's, there's this measurement reporting. Yeah, if it, it would it would need need to be uh, supported both the UE, but the UE is mostly um, run. It's it's like you you need to support to give the configuration. But it, this, it is yeah, or and and process it and then I mean the network could have then implementation support to do something smart with the with with the reporting. But uh, the most most complication is is on the UE side, in all in all of these standardized. There's one question maybe on the frequency, but I don't know if it's already responded. So um, there's a question on the frequency that says, will the network be able to restrict use to specific frequency? Mm, I don't see that. So could, could you repeat? So will the network be able to restrict the use to specific frequencies? Uh, yes, yes, you can in the handover command you give give uh, give the you the very which very even idle mode you you can steer the you to camp in a certain to prefer certain frequencies, but then I'm not sure if the you can connect to any frequency then it may might not to, may need to be steered back to some preferred yeah. fre frequency. I agree with Alkalina, but th that is really nothing to do with UAV. That is true for any 350 p mobile device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is nothing specific for the UAV. Now, if the question yeah. is whether a carrier could, uh, let's say, put these side lobes of up till up till till lobes on specific frequencies, so that the UAVs would use those specific frequencies, it's a matter of network planning. And then, uh, as Alkalina said, uh, moving the UAV to those frequencies uh, in connected and idle mode. So you push the, no. the UE to that. No, much simpler than that. And apologies, I'm I'm not technology expert. Just uh, if for any reason one regulator decided to forbid a specific set of frequencies um, that we would be usually using for traditional cellular, um, can we can we on the network side? Uh, is that the Technolo technology ability to say, well, you know, for drones specific, we, we don't use 2.6, let's say. Yes. Yes, you can. Again, this has nothing to do with UAVs. This is something normal to any 3 PUE. Okay, thank you. There was maybe a, another question. Um... And actually, sorry, uh, we one advantage because a 3GBP UAV has a specific type of subscription. So it's identified as an aerial vehicle. So it's even easier to know that if there are restrictions to be applied, these they need to be applied to the UE with aerial subscription. So you have even a better ability to differentiate uh, UAVs from normal 3GBP UAVs. Yes, indeed. Going to that one, there's a question from uh, Johnny, I think he's answering, uh, you, we just answered a question. Is the intended that there will be a different SIM specifically for UAVs? There will be a different subscriptions. Is I hope that in, answers. In, in I think in many countries it, it they have to have. I think it's it's a uh, depends on the regulations. Correct. Um, there's a question maybe from uh, Yurki to if we would be able to. Um, what would be the best resource to see the detail on the 3GPP studies um, done in 2017, apart from the 36777? Uh, you, uh, are you interested in the in these like mess simulations and field okay. results, that type of? I think yes, that's I think exactly. Yes, um, yes. I, well, <laughs> it, I think it's through the publications. If you go one uh, slide, uh, back to the references, we have at least provided um, one simulation. The 
paper that that is one all these i think that you you can have i mean these and references therein and then these uh more details on on these specification support is in the book but the book doesn't at least from my part it doesn't have anything on the about these simulations or field trials but then the first two papers have simulations and the second one also fit Field trials. I, now I don't remember all the references of those papers, but yeah, I think that. I've got a uh, number of links. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. So I think there will be more questions, but if you don't mind, Alcalina, we yeah. move to Frances. But you feel free to continue to answer the questions. So as they are on the chat. Um, so please uh, feel free to to provide more uh, more detail. Uh, so with this one, then I uh, will welcome uh, Francesca. So Francesca, again, uh, I think uh, just tell me when uh, when you want to go on the on the next slide. So I will uh, give you then the uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um... Yeah, and, and I have a number of links at the end of my presentations with network studies um, that, that can be clicked into when Barbara shares the presentation um, and the names. So you can screenshot those and look them up because I love to deep dive into those, uh, into those publications. And if you'd like more, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or via email. Um, I'd be happy to send you 13 of them. So um, actually, Barbara, if you'd like to go ahead and advance to the next slide, um, I'm going to do so. I have four sections here, uh, a lot of plain black screens. Um, I'm going to do a short introduction of the drone, um, of kind of like the market conditions of the drone, the ever evolving market conditions of the drone industry and the vision for it. Talk a little bit about mobile network support um, and go specifically into you know, how a mobile network operator um, looks at, at commercialization and how that impacts scale. And then I would like to talk a little bit about new features and future opportunities and then go into what's next. So with that, um, my role at Verizon is, uh, is to look at how we use our network for things that fly. And that's traditionally looked at how do we use an existing network? Um, and then now that we're making the transition to 5G, how do we use future networks? And something really great that we found in the middle of that is that it's not just a use the network to offer connectivity. There's a lot of advanced things that we could do and i um, talk to you a little bit about those. So uh, Barbara, if you could please advance. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about, um, I just want to give you a snip of an industry forecast. And any industry forecast that you look at for drones, they're all going to look really similar. They're this hockey stick with a super attractive future and really nice revenue opportunities. And for years, this chart has remained fairly unchanged and has simply shifted to the right. It's been adjusted for COVID, supply chains, et cetera. So I scrubbed all the exact values off of here because, again, it hasn't really changed too much. The tipping point always lies at the anticipated point where BV loss operations start to become standard. And for those who are unfamiliar, BV loss means the ability to operate a drone. Just checking. I lost the the, the voice. Can you confirm? Me too. You? Okay. Yeah. So Francesca, we lost your voice. I don't know. Apologies for that. Uh... Don't know what happened. Let me just type it. Is Francesca? Can you hear us? Francesca, we 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 can't hear you. Francesca, I, need, you I think now? you need to fly. You need to fly a little bit lower to get better <laughs> coverage. Sorry. Yeah, seriously. But are you guys able to hear me now? Now we can. Yes. Please. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Teams just told me it kicked me out um, and refreshed. So I apologize about that. Um, 
Okay, so I think I was talking about um, the fact that we believe that beyond visual line of sight is, is needed for, for highly automated scale drone operation, um, uh, operations. And um, the, some of the things to note here is that the, optimiza uh, the optimism around the drone market continues to increase. So a couple of years ago, uh, the, the compound annual growth rate anticipated was like 24% as presented by ABI. And this year, although I haven't seen um, a new ABI study out on drones since since one was last published in 2020, um, Drone Industry Insider is anticipating a 60% a growth rate um, in the um, uh, enterprise space. So there's a couple of really neat things that are happening in addition to that sentiment. Um, and the number one thing being that the convergence of expectations are uh, around, re or, I'm sorry, is the convergence of expectations in reality. So that's a signal of maturation. Um, and the other one is the actions on behalf of the really important actors. So last year, the FAA in the US completed an aviation rulemaking committee, and that's a cohort of over 100 companies that represents various industries. And they give input on what would it take to get scalable, economically viable, and environmentally advantageous beyond visual line of sight operations. So that was completed in February. You can read the rule. I've actually got the link to the, to the um, the final report at the end of this document. And so what happens now is the FAA kind of goes into a quiet mode and they write rules based on this. But ultimately what we know as an industry is that this curve, this th there's a hugely validated great opportunity for drones to do awesome things in the market and everybody make money on it. Um, it really, we have to have cleared roadmaps and regulatory frameworks. And so um, I hope that I can impress to you, you know, that number one, there's a really awesome, I think there's a really awesome way to, to look at this market commercially today and make money um, and also do our due diligence by advancing those, um, those regulations and sometimes doing one meets the other. Uh, so next slide, please. All right, so um, there's a video on GSMA for Mobile World Congress, the aviation summit um, that we did for uh, in, earlier this year where I go a little bit more into detail to this diagram. But I want to use this diagram to just start with painting what we believe is a vision um, and have created this illustration of, about how we believe mobile networks can support the advancing future of drones. And if I bring your attention to the left where it says cellular link between the remote pilot and command and the drone, that's where we're used to today. This is what we do. We connect devices. Mobile network operators connect devices to their network. Um, and what I'm going to share with you today is that we understand and we know that flying objects work very differently on the network. Um, and this is this link alone is a difficult one to figure out. Um, and I encourage us all to make a decision and, and figure out how it works for us. And we could leave our business opportunity right here. And that is OK. But we actually don't have to because mobile network operators have the ability to deliver a lot of key services above and beyond the connectivity or that enhance the C2 experience. And that's where these other links come in from this middle entity. Um, and this is all about operating, providing operationally functional um, or operationally advantageous information to the drone operator, to the pilot, to the regulatory authorities um, with contextual information about the mission, about the conditions of the network. And um, this was touched on a little bit when it comes to the topic of coverage planning is really the most, the most um, prevalent and most high demand um, example of, of the type of service that can be offered here. That's not a communications link service, but it is an operationally advanced service that when combined with context about the mission, the pilot, the drone, and the regulatory approvals that are wrapped around that mission brings a very high value. Um, mobile networks can also provide a lot of information to UTM services as well. Um, and mobile network operators can make a choice to fulfill one or many of these roles. Um, and that's really a business choice. Um, the most important thing though, is that Drones have to be able to easily connect and access services on a cellular network, whatever kind of services they need to access. And we saw demand for many, many different types of architecture because it's a new creative industry. Um, and as a mobile network operator, we have to protect the performance, the efficiency, and the integrity of our network. Um, 
Next slide, please. Barbara, are you able to advance or am I just lagging here? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna hop into talking a little bit about how cellular operates in the air. Um, and this was already covered. So I'll be kind of quick going through here. Um, but essentially what we talked about is that, you know, cellular networks are designed for terrestrial use and signals travel higher at altitude because you have this free space. Um, and so therefore a drone gets to see more cells than a cellular network is intended, is intended and designed to, to allow someone to see. Your antenna patterns are different. So uh, as Helena Mika uh, mentioned, you're operating on side lobes and mobility becomes more challenging. Um, next slide, please. Apologies, there's some delay, but I hope you can see it now. Oh yeah, no worry. Um, I'm actually like in the in the mountains of North Idaho, right south of Canada too. So I, I don't know if the delays on your side or mine. Um, so what does this mean for performance? We talked a little bit about, about mobility and, and um, these pictures I wanna show you. So these are from an Erickson paper published, which I have some links in here, really great paper that talked about talks about um, some impact studies and performance studies. And what you see from the left moving over to the right is these are cell association patterns. So when you're on the ground, which is on the left, you know, and a user walks basically from, you know, one cell into another. And then as you start to go up these, although it's very beautiful in color, um, you start to move through many different cells. And then something really odd happens at 400 feet. It all of a sudden gets much more clear again and then gets really complicated. Um, and so this presents challenges for mobility because what will be happening is you'll be cruising along in a drone attached to a really good uh, signal which may be 30 miles away and suddenly it's not there anymore and now all of a sudden it drops when you're in the presence of really great uh, service so for performance this means that you that drones have a potential to increase interference on the network and they may experience reduced reliability for a mobile network operator, and I think this is a really important top, a really important point, and I want to bring your attention to this. For a mobile network operator, this means that for us to serve aerial UEs, it utilizes more resources to get the same performance as a ground device, especially when we start to talk about the application. Um, so this calculus is not perfectly clear uh, because it's going to be different on base, based on different networks, serving different drones, different areas, times a day, and all of these different services. So this is what we spent a lot of time um, looking at, and I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail here. All right, next slide, please. And I'll start talking while it's refreshing. Um, so as I mentioned, my whole role inside of Verizon for three years has been how we look at in, 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 uh, existing infrastructure and develop terrestrial uses, or sorry, developed for terrestrial use, and how do we look at it to serve um, a use case for what it wasn't designed, and that's airborne. Um, and I will say through talking to hundreds and hundreds of people that they want to purchase services to use cellular to connect their drones. This has been verified and validated pretty well. And so um, mobile network operators, one of the parts of generating revenue-based on our network services is, like I mentioned, we have the responsibility to protect the efficiency, the performance, and the integrity of our mobile network. And we can start with what we know best. And the user wants to connect the drone to their controller via cellular network in some way, shape, or form. And so I often get asked, what can the network do? To which I often reply, whatever you're willing to pay enough to do. Because we have an awesomely amazing resource to serve this market. And the question is, is using our resources to serve the UAS in the desired way, does that meet our business case? And to what extent? And so I strongly, strongly believe it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when drones are going to connect to every mobile network. Um, and today, people are using cell phones and iPads and low-flying aircraft all the time. But the total impact of them doing this is so small that it's likely imperceptible to a network. And that's because these devices are probably being used for text, small video calls, and small amounts of data. But when the business case changes, 
and airborne devices are now being used for very high throughput on a mobile network, it's absolutely the opportunity, it absolutely presents the opportunity for impact um, to the integrity of the network to happen. So my, my notes here, I very, very strongly mean this when I talk to anybody in the, in the, um, in the design space for drones, that if they're talking to a mobile network operator and that mobile network operator goes, yeah, whatever, sure, connect a drone to our network, do whatever you want. I strongly encourage them to consider, to consider um, their, their relationship with that mobile network operator because when a mobile network operator doesn't understand how aerial devices can impact or behave on their network, um, it may not be setting their customers up for a long-term um, strategy and, um, and design success. So I, I firmly believe that we have to understand, we have to increase our internal competency, and then we have to, we have to understand the market and, and our particular customers. Every mobile network operator is going to be different, um, but that's all going to impact our internal portfolio strategy on how to support this. Um, and Barbara, if you can advance, I'll go ahead and just keep keep going since I know there'll be a bit of a delay. But ultimately what we wanna look at is we need to provide scalable long-term services that align with the economics of the UAS market and align with our economics. Because as I mentioned, networks can do a lot, but is a drone operator going to pay 12 times what a ground, what a person on the ground uh, will pay for their services? The answer is no, because that's the whole reason people are looking at cellular networks is because they offer a functional advantage at a low cost in a scalable ecosystem. And when we're looking at developing an airborne network layer, essentially, whether we're looking at deploying new equipment or whether we're using existing equipment, we really have to look at it as a brand new function of the network. Um, and not just a new use case, but a brand new function because the RF is so different in the air. And um, we already talked a little bit about what this is starting to translate to in standards, like the way that we have to look at the devices, the way we have to identify them. But ultimately, um, we've, we've looked at this um, as a brand new layer because we understand that treating the devices in the air as the same on the ground is just simply not going to work. There's a unique behavior of cellular um, in the air that's very different from the ground. It impacts our network. It impacts the amount of resources that we need to utilize to meet the needs of UAS. So we need to look at, this is, our, this is kind of the things that go into our calculus. What is our performance of the network? What is the impact that serving that performance does to our network? Because that's gonna tell us how many resources that we need to use to meet the needs of that UAS use case. And then what is the cost? What is the customer ultimately really willing to pay for this? Um, we've, we have commercialized a number of services. And um, while I'm talking here, Barbara, if you'd like to advance the next one, um, we've commercialized a number of services based on these things. And that is a continuing evolving space because 3GPP standards are changing. That's going to change the performance impact. 5G is emerging, that's going to change the performance impact, and the market is advancing, so that's going to change what people are willing to pay. Um, and when we look at network impact, um, it's not this linear, it's not this linear, this many drones equals this many grounds on your, or this many terrestrial devices on your um, network. It's, it's a, uh, in my experience, there's been absolutely nothing linear, or even a consistent, um, about it without multiple, it's very dynamic. So the most notable observation here is that when we're looking to associate the resources utilized and the cost of serving airborne um, users, it is not this simple relationship. There's not a clear function that says, you know, here's what the air and ground looks like is. Um, there's a number of variables. The leading ones being what spectrum are you used, what, connect, what frequencies are being connected to, um, and some of this is going to be nationwide frequency. Some of it is going to be shared spectrum in certain areas. Some of this is going to be more heavily used inside of an urban area or a suburban area. Um, we also need to look at the application. What is the drone doing? Um, and I'll go a little bit more into what a drone will do in a minute here. What altitude is it operating at? What's the geography? Is this urban, suburban, rural? 
um, what's the density of the network? Um, like what's the load profile? You know, this generally correlates with time and traffic patterns and events. Um, how do we handle, you know, these dynamic unexpected and unforeseen events when we're, when we're working with services like this? Um, and an example is that an aircraft performing the same mission in a very congested urban environment versus a rural clear environment is going to look very differently. And I've personally performed a lot of tests. I think when I tallied it up last, it was a little over 300 cumulative hours only during the pandemic um, that we were flying simply to look at the performance across all of these different variables. Um, and one, what, what we ultimately found is one single mission may cause an issue on a network in under one set of conditions, and it may not cause an issue on the network under another set of conditions. So when we start looking at how we deploy and commercialize these services, we have to look at our network policies that we set, how they're enforced, and how we're controlling the network quality across all of these different variables. And to do this, we make sure that we, the first thing we have to make sure is that we can isolate UAVs from ground users to see drone specific performance and also apply those drone specific policy rules. This is a lot of what was, um, what is be, uh, being talked about in 3GPP for those services. Um, and there needs to be two considerations. So when we're talking about identifying drones, um, the first one, and this is the easier one, is for self-identifying cooperative drones. Um, and, and there's a lot of ways to implement this via process. You know, mobile network operators already do this today. You know, simply the difference between identifying an iPhone versus identifying a Samsung Galaxy. Um, the challenge is also how do we identify non-cooperative drones? Because I'll drop a little something that scared me when someone told it to me, but it, it's real and we have to think about it. If I am sitting here telling you I've done stress tests and I know that there is a situation where putting a whole bunch of drones on a network could cause impact to a network, and we don't have a way of identifying non-cooperative drones, we're actually opening ourselves up to a threat on our network, something that could look similar to a denial of service attack. So here's the thing, whether or not a mobile network operator makes a decision to support drones on their network, we have to make a decision of how to deal with airborne devices using our network. Um, and, and this comes into the non-cooperative space. It's a matter of network security, network health, and protecting our network efficiency um, and integrity. So um, a couple other things. We also did a pretty extensive study on implementation of directional antenna. And I, I added this in here because it came up um, we, we put that on pause due to engineering feasibility concerns because implementing a directional antenna on a very small UAV is, is um, well, it's a block. You know, just small UAVs don't really have the option, the resources, uh, the size, weight, and power to facilitate directional antenna. But for larger UAVs, such as passenger carrying and cargo carrying UAVs, this is much, much more realistic option for increasing performance and decreasing network impact. Again, um, you can add that to one of these variables here. If a drone has a directional antenna, now it's going to perform very differently inside of these areas. It's going to perform much more advantageous. So coming back to how, does, how do you manage the policy through your entire ecosystem of the, of the mobile network stack? Everything from the device being designed, the device being identified to the uh, services and policies being set and the services and application um, that that drone is allowed to access. So um, we really need to think about these things end to end. Um, and today we use, you know, today we use the same process for establishing um, what that what the impact and performance is as we would on the ground. And that's just today because we started with what we knew. So we use the same tools, spectrum analyzers and probes mounted to drones. We do a lot of flying um, and we assess the same KPIs. We are starting to understand that going forward, um, we are going to have to look at different KPIs or, or expanded set of KPIs, or perhaps we're looking at KPIs in a different way. Um, and a little plug here, that's one of the groups in ACJA is also looking at this of, you know, what KPIs does a mobile network operator need to look at and how do they need to look at them uh, with respect to drones. Um, so the last note, you know, just is just 
just kind of reiterating is that in order for us to understand the network impact, we really have to understand the use case. So, um, and, and uh, Barbara, if you want to advance, this would be a great time to advance. Um, so the good thing is, is that a lot of this is pretty well, um, pretty well understood today. The drones of current, the needs of current drones today. Um, and this is where we start to move into airborne performance. So on the left here, we have services that we traditionally believe 4G LTE can serve really well. And then on the right, we start to move into where we believe 5G needs to be used or higher performance or a network service that can provide the performance needed at a lower resource utilization. It um, has to be in place to serve these higher end use cases. Um, and we can break these down into business use case and flight control. And um, these functions, um, they can serve. So we'll start really quick. Um, on the left hand side. So functions such as telemetry and basic command for the drone, um, like I said, supported very well by, um, by 4G today. However, these are the highest regulated services right now. So when we talk about regulation kind of being the biggest blocker, it's for the purpose of command and control of a drone long range. So it's that beyond visual line of sight. And this is where cellular networks just shine. Um, but for the business purpose, like streaming, um, HD streaming of a video, these things are also really, really high demand. Um, and they're not, they're not highly regulated today, but these are also the things that impact our network more. So this is the creative space that we have to do some calculus when we're figuring out like what services can we release on our network and how. Um, I have a super high confidence that services for what 4G can serve have been established really well and that we can move forward for quite a while um, from the perspective of using 4G for command and control. Um, when it comes to the business case, you know, today we know that we could do some video streaming. And again, you know, we understand how that impacts our network. Um, other mobile networks may work slightly differently. Um, or they may have just a different a different load profile, and they may say, "Well, you know, it either you we can offer you less or more." Um, but we know today, 4G does very very well to support these command and control functions and flight control functions, and then it does pretty well for like sending images, doing some low, doing some um, video streaming, and and doing some of the business use, and. The reason I think that's really important is because I'll give you an example. I was flying in Chicago a few months back and we were doing some 5G testing and we are right smack in the middle of downtown Chicago flying over the water. We we're really just trying to get the messiest, messiest signal that we can get. And we have the ability to fly quite a ways under the, the operational approval that we had. We could have flown probably up to two miles, two and a half miles because we had such great line of sight we could not fly further than about a football field. We couldn't even get all the way down the beach. The reason being is it was such a noisy environment. And so this is where, um, when we do start talking about operating drones in these really noisy environments, even if we're operating line of sight, doing command and control is still really valuable to be doing over a cellular network because you, have, um, you don't have that, that super high interference in an unlicensed um, spectrum. Um, but then of course, you know, the HD video streaming and, and the, um, the transferring images and videos, this is the really high demand capability today that's not regulated. And this is where we have an opportunity to say, if we can meet that use case today, we can commercially find value to serve users today and not have to wait for regulations. And while we're cracking these things, guess what, you know, regulators, we're going to be able to show regulators some really awesome um, performance statistics. So um, let's see. Um, my last note on this one is, I believe being very, very clear is very kind. Um, and I've talked a lot about having to establish your network competency um, or increasing your internal competency around what a network can do. I talked a little bit about how we have to, how we look at the trade-off between performance, the trade and and impact to our network, and the amount of you know money and revenue that we can generate. 
how we established impact and how that is not a straightforward calculus at all. And that we need to look at it from end to end of our entire system from a perspective of maintenance engineering, network planning, and just overall looking at our network from a health perspective, in addition to supporting the application layer. Um, and then for the application layer, we really, really need to understand what our customers want to do. And we have to be very clear about how they can and cannot use our networks. Um, and I'll say today, um, I've tried my best to be good at this. It's a really, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, I don't think there's anybody, any customer in the market who has ever told me that they have a clear understanding of how cellular networks can be used. They're like, I think I can connect to this operator. I don't know. We're just using their SIMs. They don't say anything. Or, you know, even Verizon, I think I can do this, but I, you know, you tell me I can only do this. What can we do? So I think one thing that we as an entire um, an uh, ecosystem need to do is to be very clear about how developers in the market can utilize our mobile networks. And then uh, because that allows them to make clear business decisions about their product design and their go to market strategies. And let's just be honest, without them having really successful go to market strategies, we're not going to be successful in this space. So we really are, we have to be an enabler and really do everything we can to support them. Um, and cellular may not be the best solution for every UAS being designed today, and that's okay. Um, but where we do have a responsibility to support this development is simply being clear about setting boundaries about what is okay and what is not okay for using our network. Because today, um, and I'll, I'll get in a little bit to like optimizations, today, if someone came to me and said, hey, I need to stream 20 megabits uplink of HD video streaming over downtown Chicago, across five different drones to capture this one particular event and they need to do it on LTE and I wanna do it today, I would unfortunately have to tell them, no way. That's, we're just not quite there yet, you know? And, and we're not there for the public masses to be able to do things like that. And so where we have to get, um, where we are today is networks today can support the one-off cases and the small, not scaled industry very, very well today. But once it starts to scale, we need optimizations. Um, and you could go ahead and advance, Barbara, because this is what gets into the 3GPP features. Um, and Hathkalina covered this really, really well. So I actually won't go too much into this. Um, but I firmly believe that today, mobile networks can support drones exactly the way they are. But as the industry starts to scale, these features are going to have to be implemented in order for us to better support drones. And I don't just mean better support drones, like giving drones a better performance. That's important too. But in protecting the integrity and the quality of our network. So um, these features today are not implemented across all the ecosystems. Uh, Halkalina mentioned that a lot of this is really UE heavy. Um, I think the RAN vendors have been very generous and open to saying, yes, we'll support these as well. There's not a lot of dependence on the core network uh, providers to, to implement a lot of features here, um, but there is a lot of work to be done on the UE, on the UE side, so on the chipset side. Um, so um, understanding the line between when these features are a must have and is an okay not to have is what we have done by increasing our internal competency of how our network can serve drones um, so that we can foster a better dialogue with our ecosystem partners covering the RAN and the chipsets um, when deploying new features and supporting new, new markets. Um, and as Hakalina mentioned, these features are limited to 4G and the work is you know, being done to, to make them uh, compatible with 5G as well. Uh, for release 15. And she already reviewed a lot of these in detail, so I'm just going to touch on the benefits um, that when we talk about power control, that allows us, mobile network operators, more configuration for uplink interference mitigation. Um, and this is something I'm very, very familiar with um, because we have, we have done studies and implemented this across our network um, today as much as we can, you know, um, We've implemented versions of this based on um, based on the ecosystem of what is available today. Um, the height rate based reporting allows us to properly maintain the QoS for the for the aerial device um, and also helps control the uplink interference. So again, very selfishly, we really really want to protect our network. But when we protect our network, 
we can offer more to the user. Um, the subscription-based identification, again, this is super important. Um, Helkalina really touched on this very well, but we need to be able to identify devices on our network, cooperative devices and non-cooperative devices. Um, and that's cooperative devices is a little more simple because there's a feature here that can be implemented by any mobile network operator um, and how they actually trickle that through their ecosystem and, and use that for quality assurance on making sure that, you know, they're only serving the, the um, right policies, the right airborne policies to airborne devices. Every mobile network operator will implement that differently. Um, but I really think we need to start thinking about how do we, how, what are we going to do about drones that are flying on our network that, um, that are not self-reporting? You know, they're doing it today. They're just not doing it in a way that, um, that we're being able to pick up yet. And you never know, you might have an anomaly in an area and not be able to identify it and then later find out it was a drone. I have seen that happen before. Um, and the last one with the flight path planning. So this really could facilitate like service optimization for the aerial device. However, there is a strong application-based dependency here. Um, and this starts to move into really advanced network features um, that I'm gonna go into in this last section here. Um, uh, so yeah, um, Barbara, you can go ahead and advance two slides, please. Um, so I'm going to start talking about some new features here. I'm going to touch a little bit on millimeter wave, 5G architectures, and advanced uh, services to support UAS. So I get a lot, um, a lot of mention from people in the market going like, ah, oh, we don't even think about millimeter wave and drones. And I've just never really understood that. Um, and my background is in hardware engineering. So I look at everything from a hardware perspective first. And it is a hard, it's, it's a difficult challenge from a hardware perspective. But I always thought about like, this actually seems like a really great use case. And so my team and I just, we've been exploring millimeter wave in the, in the air for over a year now. And we've had some really extremely encouraging results. Um, and to our excitement, we found that a lot of the features that cause heartache for LTE networks actually make millimeter wave pretty uniquely positioned to serve drones. Um, and so some of our early studies and, and uh, Barbara, if you could please advance to the next slide. Some of our early studies show that, um, that uh, we get really high performance with lower interference in that under 400 feet AGL space. Um, and that's why in this image here, I kind of have like, today we're looking at low flying drones because our millimeter wave is set up in cities and it's really meant to like, you know, they're, they're very low to the ground. You know, we don't have these at the top of buildings. They have this lower, um, lower propagation. And so we're just looking at how does existing implementations of millimeter wave serve drones today? Um, and we've had some great results. And um, as the next slide is loading, I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit um, a little bit to some of those features. So um, one of the examples is the lower propagation of millimeter wave signals because you've got these really short, short wavelengths um, actually offsets the propagation and free space challenges that cause airborne devices to see too many towers. So when a drone is in the air, it sees tons and tons of LTE towers because LTE just reaches really, really far because it's on this lower wavelength. Um, but when you have a very short wavelength and you have a lower propagation and now you're above trees and cars and houses, all of a sudden those two things come together to serve drones pretty well. Um, and then we also have beam forming. And so what we found is that the overall impact to the network um, is, is uh, it's not raising as much of a concern when using millimeter wave um, as, it, as it does in 4G. Um, and on my side, it still shows the, the picture of the slide with the city. Is that, is that still the one that you guys see? I'm on the next slide, but I don't know if everybody sees that next oh, slide. There it does. It just tonight. popped up. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so this is a snapshot from one of our tests where you know I like to go stress test our network um, in a very safe way, um, where you can see on the left, we, we did stress tests in the exact same location, one being on LTE and one being on millimeter wave. Um, so 
just really, really interesting thing that happens here is that LTE is receiving near cell power, but experiencing mid cell to cell edge RSRQ. And that's what we see a lot is the reason being is because LTE has such high power received from so many different cells that it's creating a much higher inter interference on the network. However, if you look to the right, um, or I'm sorry, that LTE is on the right. If you look to the left where a millimeter wave is, you see that dynamic flip. So millimeter wave is getting, is getting um, like mid cell power, but it's getting really high quality signal. So I personally think this is great news um, because it's really high performance spectrum. You know, there's lots of it. Um, and it provides a new use case to start exploring, like monetizing and loading this highly, value, highly valuable spectrum. And of course, as I mentioned, um, there's coverage, there's, there's challenges with coverage and power when we talk about millimeter wave. Um, but I personally think that we have to start looking at this as a top, topic of spectrum mix um, and spectrum management. And Barbara, if you'd like to advance to the next one, please. Um, and so this topic came up a bit and there was a question on using approved spectrum. Um, and I agree with Stefano, this is really a matter of network planning because today, yes, there is the capability for us to manage this on the network side. I'll tell you, it's not a simple thing to do. So um, there's a, a number of different places that you can um, implement uh, spectrum locking or spectrum choice. Uh, you can do it at the application layer, at the device layer, at the module layer. Uh, or you could do it at the network layer. Um, today, it's been my experience that really the best place to do it is on the device layer. And to be perfectly honest, it's actually a fairly simple thing to do on the device layer from a, a device manufacturer perspective. Um, it's not most ideal for them because device manufacturers and drone manufacturers would prefer to create one thing and use it anywhere. Um, but creating one device with like, say a firmware that locks out certain bands based on what carrier they're connected to, that, that's not a very, very heavy lift. At least today, it hasn't been a complete deal breaker. Um, but when it comes to spectrum, uh, with the emergence of 5G, and we have a, a, a very wide range of spectrum to work with, low, mid, and high frequencies, and that's never happened before in cellular. And we really have to look at like, how are we managing and balancing all of these? Um, but when we start talking about operating in the air, um, it's much more restrictive from an FCC perspective than terrestrial devices. And again, this is today, this is specific to the US, um, but you can see from this table here that these are all the NR bands for 5G and all the ones in red and orange are prohibited based on the FCC spectrum tables um, and the FCC interpretation of, of um, not being able to operate on the 850 megahertz um, bands in the air. So for this reason, we have extra, extra motivation to look at millimeter wave to understand how we can load and monetize the spectrum to serve a highly unique industry. Um, and Barbara, you can advance to the next one. As you can see, I have all the resources in here. So I encourage to click around um, and, and, uh, and look into these tables. Um, so I actually think this is an amazingly creative problem to be tackled. Um, and it's been one of the most exciting challenges to think about. And as I mentioned, there, there's real problems to be tackled on the topic of device power from a millimeter wave and coverage perspective, um, but we're thinking about these things as well. And as that slide is transitioning, I've got an image here um, that I'll start talking to, but um, I talked about, all right, millimeter wave behaves way, way different. And we have the biggest challenges are like, where is mil millimeter wave deployed? we know that it's probably not going to be feasible to deploy millimeter wave across the entire US um, and have it offer ubiquitous coverage like LTE does today or you know, emerging 5G will, lower band 5G will today. But um, we, can, we can look at this from a perspective of mode of operation. And so we can start by looking at the phase of flight and understand what needs to be accomplished by the mission and what can be supported by the cellular wink link, when, how, um, and where. So when this image refreshes, at least it hasn't refreshed on my end yet, um, what you'll see is a picture of a drone taking off from one location and moving to another location to perform a mission. And what this drone is doing is it's taking off in a location, I used the example of a drone in a box, it's taking off from a location where 4G LTE is the primary support. And so we could say, okay, 
This drone is going to take off and it's going to cruise to its mission and it's going to depend on 4G LTE to support dispatch and command and control. And then once it gets to its location, this is for the purpose of, let's say, emergency response and situational awareness. Once it reaches its destination, its primary function is now changed. When it takes off, its primary function is to support the safe transport to where it needs to perform its mission. And then once it gets to that location, its primary function is now switched. And its primary function is now to provide high definition video to be live casted to various stakeholders and facilitate situational awareness and control. Um, and on my end, it's still on the spectrum. Has it updated for you guys? Cause I can just keep going. On the uh, next one, but I don't know the other okay. one. Let's see, it, uh, it kept going. It's okay. Yep, there we go. It's it's there now. Um, so you can see here, like where we we can look at how we're using spectrum and how we're using our resources based on the phase of flight, because millimeter wave and four G and even low band five G are very very different assets. They're going to offer very different performance, and they're going to have to be managed very differently. Um, and and um, the question of how does this get managed to either, uh, how does the transition from one technology get managed? Um, how does the drone manage, you know, providing one application when it's in the right coverage zone? How does it manage this from a perspective of planning? Is it done by the application? Is it done by the network? How are the application and the network working together to manage this? And how are they ensuring that the drone has the right set, um, set of network services to facilitate a safe and effective mission? And even furthermore, get approval for that mission. Because the whole point of this drone being deployed is to get out there in real time, really quickly, get eyes on a situation, a dynamic situation that nobody could anticipate happening, and provide very high valuable information to a set of operators in real time and Barbara, if you can advance the slide, I can go a little bit more into detail of what that looks like. Um, and this is a very awesome challenge to figure out, but it is absolutely a challenge. Um, because what is happening here is this drone is capturing high resolution video of a live scenario. It's taking that video, the telemetry and the sensor data from different sensors on that drone. And it's, it's transferring it over, let's say, a very, in this situation, a very low latency 5G network that allows very high throughput. Um, the telemetry and the video from that, that drone is being synchronized, combined. It may have some AI, ML, like visual overlays and other application services being added to it so that it can augment the data. And that data may also be being stored for event reconstruction, data enrichment, training, operational compliance, et cetera. So that video feed is then, and in that situation, I'll back up for a second. In that situation, this is where like new architectures with 5G come in. Maybe that's being done via MEC. Um, maybe it's being done a different way. Um, today, MEC seems like a really fantastic way to serve this use case. Now, once that happens, this video case, this video is being multicasted to accessible, to be made accessible on a variety of different devices. And this might be one of many different key stakeholders that needs to be accessing that data so that they can make an operational, actionable operational decision in that near real time. So this might be a person on the ground via a smartphone. It might be a person in an operations room on a computer, you know, somebody else on a tablet. But the point is, that is the whole reason this drone is being deployed, is so that these people can get valuable operational insight real time and make actionable decisions that are going to, you know, that are hopefully going to going to um, end in a, a better outcome for whatever the situation is. So I showed this situation for, um, or I showed this use case for situational awareness and emergency response this exact same workflow and the same architectures to facilitate this um, can be applied to the inspection of critical assets, disaster response, and any other use case which requires live video for lo low latency and operational support. And here is the awesome, awesome, awesome kicker. You can replace this drone with a robot. You can replace this drone with a smart car. You can actually even replace this drone with any other uh, sensor that has to operate in a dynamic environment or might be moving, 
this use case does not break. It is the exact same thing. So I talked to you a lot about how drone, how devices in the air operate very differently from devices on the ground. That's from an RF perspective and that's from a resource perspective. So that's the big decision we've had to look at number one. But big decision we look at number two is how are we using our networks in a very intelligible way? How are we commercializing and creating go-to-market strategies that support the really, really high valuable needs of what our customers need to get done? And when we start talking about that, a drone is a robot, is a automated car, is any type of the is any type of, yeah, we'll just say vehicle that is mobile, operating in dynamic situations, needs to operate with in in, a, in, in complex situations where human operators and other systems may need to make decisions operationally based on the location of that device or that device may need to make operational decisions based on its environment. So um, having a mobile network that can support these complex and advanced use cases is a problem that we are working on uh, solving and monetizing today. Um, and a lot of these things, we don't have to wait for regulations because these are valuable business use cases that the, the, the industry wants to pay for today. They don't want to pay $1,000 a month per device. Okay, we, we get that. But the challenge of us understanding like they will pay more than a, a ground subscriber will pay for a cell phone. Um, so us figuring out what are we willing to do? What can we do? Um, and how much are we gonna pay for, uh, charge for that is really, is really important. Um, so I've got two more slides here. Uh, Barbara, if you'd like to advance to the next one. Um, so what I was just talking about is, is moving into operationally advanced services opportunities. So we talked a lot about, spent the majority of this time talking about the connectivity between the drone and, the, and everything else that it needs to connect to using the cellular network. Um, when we start to move into the other side of that diagram and that vision that I opened up with a little bit, and when the slide advances, it'll, it'll pop up here, um, we start to talk about advanced functions. And so when we talk about um, a mobile network and what it can do here, Mobile networks have a huge amount of info or information that is operationally use useful to the UAS application layer and can be offered as services to both the UAV and the UTM ecosystem. Um, and so these services can be offered over the top as a, or over the top of the connectivity. So they're not you know, part of the connectivity at all, or they can be offered as a, um, as a value add service to the connectivity link. So these can add commercial value to the UTM ecosystem um, for the purpose of strategic and tactical uh, air and ground risk mitigation. And what that means is essentially uh, strategic air, strategic risk mitigation means I am an operator of a drone or maybe a ground robot or an autonomous vehicle, and I need to plan whatever I'm about to do. Um, and I need to plan to mitigate risk, that's strategic. Tactical is I'm in the middle of a mission. I'm driving, I'm hovering, I'm performing a mission, and I need to I need to be mitigating risk. That's tactical. Um, and all of these fall into also airspace management. So we'll see here. Um, <clears throat> mobile networks do this already quite a bit today through uh, sort of special services for like public safety. They provide advanced services that public safety could use for this. Um, and we may use other pieces of information from our network to do this and less of a uh, commercially kind of um, uh, advanced way. Um, but it's possible in the future that some of these services are actually going to be required for the use of cellular networks um, in drones in both the regulatory approval process and enforcement. So um, dropping a plug here, the next deep dive, deep dive is actually going to go a lot more into this, uh, the, the relationship between these entities here. Um, by talking about the UAS traffic management and, um, and what kind of services can be supported from a connectivity provider. And I believe it's OneSky that's going to be hosting that. Um, and they also um, can talk a little bit more about like coverage estimation and other things. But today, the, the best over the top service example is the ability to offer coverage estimation and population density. And when I say coverage estimation, you know, today we think like, oh, provide a coverage map. 
but we're talking about machines talking to machines and needing to understand if I take off in a 4G LTE area and I go across this terrain and now I need to perform this particular mission and that is gonna require this much on the link and I need this level of reliability and service reliability, it's a very dynamic situation. And so you have to have a lot of intelligence on the network layer and on the application layer in order to facilitate these really high value um, capabilities. And I, I think that um, that next deep dive will start to open up um, some good insights on, on how we're looking at that today. So um, I'm gonna ask Barbara to advance to the, the last slide that I have here. <clears throat> on performance. And this is kind of a vision of like, what are some advanced UAS applications that we could support with 5G? And, um, and I don't think this is an exhausted list. Um, I think there's so much more here to be learned. Um, and this is just, you know, kind of what we think based on what people have been saying um, and, and where we think people and where we think the industry could go and how cellular networks could be used in more advanced applications and more advanced situations. And a lot of these mean, a lot of these really come together where, you know, the business case is becoming so much more valuable because we're able to use really, really high band with low latency processing um, to offer really cool capabilities and enhance the, the, the business reason, the job to be done of the drone. But then also, the more the more assurance, the more reliability that we can get out of a drone um, from the or get out of the network, the more we can depend on the network for flight control functions. Um, and so, the network slicing is one that's mentioned here. And I, I actually didn't go into a whole slide on network slicing. I want everyone to know I think that it is an awesomely high value to the UAS market. Um, and I think network slicing is going to play a huge role in the future of drone operation. Um, it's my opinion that we're just not there today to start defining what this looks like yet. Um, from a telecom industry perspective, there's still unclear commercialization plans or strategies for employing this. And I'm not saying that from a Verizon perspective. I'm saying that from an industry perspective. I haven't seen like a cohesive, here is what network slicing for this industry needs to look like. Um, but I, I definitely think it's something that we're going to see become a lot more developed in the next one to three years. From an aviation perspective, there's still not a clear enforceable guidelines which determine how regulators are going to look at cellular networks and determine the suitability for the communications link. And I think when we start to talk about things, uh, concepts like network slicing, um, we really need the regulators at the table um, to have the correct standards in place and the correct requirements in place for how are they going to look at um, the aviation domains of communications. And today, the ACJA has um, <clears throat> a publication for the ALT aerial profile that talks about how um, mobile networks can commonly look at drones to deploy services. And we talk about data, uh, like a, a domains of, of communication in two respects, critical and non-critical. Um, and I think that's the most simple way to put it. And I'm sure it's gonna be broken down into different, you know, different, um, categories of critical, like command and control is critical. Maybe certain UTM or um, certain airspace management functions are critical. Um, and there are certain airspace functions that are not critical and payload data may not be critical. Um, so there's, there's still some, a lot of space to, to define what absolutely has to be done. And network slicing is a really fantastic way for us to look at how do we make sure that the critical capabilities are served because when we talk about words in in um in aviation words like assurance guarantee you know these things are just thrown around um and they're accepted <laughs> when you say like guarantee inside of a mobile network that's a very very expensive if not unaffordable term to use so we need to align our language. We need to get very clear about what those metrics are. And um, that is work that is being done um, in RTCA today. And hopefully we'll see some positive outcome from the, the BV loss rulemaking. So um, my, my last slide, Barbara, if you wanna hop to the one that has the three sentences on there. This is my closing slide. And as, as the slide is transitioning, um, I have three, 
three closing on what needs to be done next. And the first one is get educated. Um, so what we've done at Verizon, you know, we've assigned a subject matter expert, that's myself, and I have a group of engineers. We've learned how mobile networks perform in the air. We have um, teams from our maintenance engineering, from our network assurance team, from our HQ system, um, systems performance team, from our HQ RAM planning, core planning. So we look at it from every perspective and, and we've really dug into understanding how it performs in the air. We've developed test tank campaigns to assess our mobile networks um, and understand our tolerance for airborne applications. Um, and then we have done a huge amount of work, a huge, huge amount of work in assessing the level of interest in using our network for airborne applications amongst our largest customers and our prospective engagements. Um, and so this has allowed us to look at opportunities that are near term and use this as a perspective for test and development. Um, and just a little hint, uh, you'd be amazed how many customers would be happy to like work with you on this and do the flying for you. Um, OEMs, drone OEMs, drone manufacturers, really, really need mobile network operators. Um, they need to be educated. The FAA needs to be educated. Standards bodies need to be educated. You'd be amazed how many of these companies, uh, organizations, and customers would love to work with you and do some of the flying for you if that's not your expertise in a mobile network space. Um, the second thing is get really clear. Once you understand what your network can do and your position there, you just need, need to make a decision in, in supporting airborne applications. We've made ours. Um, the work will continue. I'm sure some of the market has seen like we've made some changes in our, our outward facing strategies towards um, how we're going about developing drone uh, applications for the drone space. Um, and we've made a move to, um, we're no longer supporting the fleet management space at this time, um, but we're continuing with our robotics work. So nothing that I've just talked to you about has changed, um, but we're making business decisions based on the fact that, you know, we're a company that needs to generate revenue and we're, we're meeting the market where it is. Um, but uh, I, I encourage any mobile network operator to do the same. Simply make a decision. And you can start really simple by looking at what you're really, really good at, the cellular network and the cellular connectivity, because there's a ton to be done here. Um, and we're the experts at cellular connectivity. Um, and that leads me into my last point. We are the experts. So let's flex our expertise. Um, not being involved in standards and, and a shaping regulatory story early that poses a risk to our ability to serve this lucrative future market. We know best what our networks are capable of, and we know best how to make, like what business decisions will, we will made. Um, and if we leave language, if we leave the language to the standards and regulatory uh, spaces to make decisions about how we can or cannot serve this market, um, we, we're really doing a disservice to the entire community, to the emerging market and to our future revenues. So um, with that, my, I keep saying last slide, but this is, the next one is truly my last slide, is just a list of resources. Um, like I mentioned, I threw a couple network studies on here. I put a link to the, the ARC final report and then have some snips on opportunities and engagements um, to get engaged with here. RTCA really, really needs cellular representation and support. So um, anybody that's in the mobile network ecosystem, I highly encourage you, if you can, please support our TCA. This is probably the single most important working group right now that you can get involved with. And just, I mean, even if you're just reviewing their documents and making sure that the language is not overly prescriptive or prohibitive for our commercial, our ability to commercialize, that's a huge, that's huge. That's a huge contribution. So please, please check out if there's somebody on your team who can support that and review it. Um, please do. And you're welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn or um, Barbara or Stefano uh, Fachin here from Qualcomm. We'll, we'll probably have contacts that can get you connected there. Um, and then ACJA is where everybody from the telecom and, um, and um, aviation industry come together so that we can talk about really coordinating. And the, the work that has been done here is truly impressive. It's truly, truly impressive. And it is impactful. And it's, it's really, really moving things so if you have any 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 time we we please ask especially from the aviation community um we we really really could use um 
perspective from the aviation community because it's the same thing. The last thing we want is cellular standards coming to fruition that really don't jive with aviation needs. So, you know, we got two very different cultures and we both need to be at the table kind of learning each other's language. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the end. So we, we, uh, we have a few minutes for questions if anybody has some. There, there are a few questions that uh, popped up on, on the chat. I think maybe the first one was from uh, Alexander. Um, you talked about uh, availability feature of 3GPP. Is, uh, is asking if there are any examples of chipset with the release 15 aerial features available. Not to my knowledge today. I've been, uh, but we're, we're still working on that. But to my knowledge, no, not the aerial ones. Uh, the other one is also from Alexander. Do you see several drone related network slides? Uh, not again, not commercialized today. Um, I haven't seen any commercial plans from any any network operator that are made public. Um, nor have I seen, I think Barbara GSMA has actually been working on defining um, like doing a deeper a deeper dive into what this could look like, what like drone, what network slicing could look like for drones. Um, but today, I've not seen any commercial plans for actual network slicing and drones, uh, specific to aviation and drones. Now, talk to that point. Indeed, there's a work restarted, and we do uh, are we are looking at that. Um, there might be some prototyping or trials done in few projects of how to use slice uh, is it just that you know the initial work to figure it out uh, the capabilities and uh, the needs of the slice but nothing commercial you're you're right mm -hmm. as far as i'm aware also yeah um there's another question let me see so Key to all services comes to aerial coverage and communication channel bandwidth availability. How can we measure it? This is a question from Mohammed. Oh, how can we measure bandwidth and availability? Correct. Oh, so that comes back to kind of that diagram um, in that uh, that I showed you on network impact. Um, you can look at that either. We look at it again from the network impact perspective, but, but from the performance perspective, um there's you know there's numbers of applications that you can that you can run to understand that but again you've got to talk to the mobile network operator because for example on verizon we have commercial policies that are enforced at the core network layer um that are at the core network that that um that uh, control the bandwidth so that it control the impact so number one is you got to talk to the network operator that you're working with to understand what policies are in place uh, because that may in itself limit your bandwidth. Um, number two, if there is no limited bandwidth there, um, you can do, you can do, there are several application tests. So um, Roden Schwartz has one that, that we use quite a bit. It's called Qualipoc. Um, that one is pretty expensive to, to buy the licensing and all the, you know, that's a probably twenty thirty thousand dollars investment. Um, but you can also, there's a great service from um, Qualcomm called um, Ooh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, blank on it, but there is a Stefano. Do you remember it? There's a there's a service from Qualcomm that you can load on a computer. Um, shoot. Okay, so there is a service from Qualcomm, um, but also you know uh, you can use iPerf uh, for doing for doing um, uh, application performance testing as well. Um, and, and build something on your own if you're not if you're not up for making the investment into these kind of like higher end tools. Um, but Roden Shorts is a really great is a really great resource to look at. Like um, they have a paper that's on quality of experience and actually measuring the application performance from the network. Um, so if you're looking at it from a perspective of performance, um, those are some great tools to look at. Um, but again talk to your mobile network operator because they may be implementing a different set of criteria that you're not aware of. And so um, you want to make sure that you understand what the mobile network operator that you're connecting to, um, if, if there is any like uh, allowances, restrictions, or special policies that you need to be aware of. Maybe to complement to that is, 
uh, because I see there's a response on the ECGA. So the ECGA is more looking at what to measure, not how to measure. Exactly. Uh, the how is left obviously the tools and things. So we're gonna look at more the what to measure than than how. Did that answer the question? In that RTCA DO three seventy seven group that I mentioned, they are um, most likely going to be the group that that specifies how to measure it. And again, that that term comes down to like the quality of the experience from the perspective of the drone. Um, so that is not something that is very clearly identified today. Um, I usually look at it from a perspective of application. So if somebody's company, if, if a company's ap primary application is, is video streaming, I say, okay, let's go back to the world of video streaming and let's talk about what are the key ways that you assess the um, performance from your video stream. Because just because you have a really good quality of service from your network doesn't mean you're going to have a good quality of experience on the application perspective. So as mobile network operators, we look at quality of service because again, we're selfishly concerned that the quality of our network stays really high and we can sell you good services. Um, but that doesn't guarantee that the application layer is going to be using those services in a way that is impactful. So that's where uh, Roden Shorts has some really good if you Google Roden Shorts quality of um, experience, you'll find a lot of really great resources about how to measure how to measure that on a cellular network from whatever perspective you're looking at it from. Uh, thank you. Before I go to the last, uh, maybe the last uh, question, I also launched a poll for you. So if you could uh, um, please uh, quickly give your uh, satisfaction level. Let's say you are satisfied with the content of these sessions. Yes or no, please. So we can um, use it for further session. And if you don't see the poll, you can go to the chat and you should be able to see the poll uh, coming up. I launched two polls now. So one is uh, on the results to, to understand if you are satisfied and if the session length is uh, good enough uh, to cover all the topics. So I leave it open for a bit. I will also launch a third one. So you have it all available. The third one is more on let us know if there is any specific topic that you would like to learn more from the um, point of view of the mobile industry, obviously. Um, if you, as I said, if you don't see it, the all the polls will be also in your chat. In the meantime, there was one question also. So is, um, for Mika, is there any efforts on collating data from networks related to flying UE from an MNS point of view? The question bases on rumor that mobile phones and connected tablets used in many cases in general aviation, even though not legal in many countries. Yeah. So if um, you have any, yeah. So from the legality perspective, I have not seen any active efforts. Um, I just share with everybody who tells me, well, we use our tablet and we use our phone all the time. I'm like, okay, well, when you do that, you're breaking FCC policy. And, you know, it is the mobile network operator's responsibility to, to uphold their license um, and, and ensure that their devices are used in a way that is compliant with their license with the FCC. And yes, using an iPhone and a tablet very well um, often will break that license, um, will violate that. Um, again, how that is detected and how much of an impact it makes today, I just don't think up to date, it's been as big of a deal. I'm not aware of any like industry efforts. Um, I am not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any today. Um, what I am aware of is, is, uh, two things being done, not on that particular topic, but on the, you know, collating, um, uh, performance and flight information over mobile networks. That is number one in ACJA uh, work task two uh, that is led by Thomas Neubauer. And he is, you know, calling to have mobile networks essentially like let's talk about a way to standardize information and let's talk about a way to collect from mobile mobile networks and, and bring this all into one place. Um, and a lot of the, the thinking and some of the methods 
behind that. We're driven by what Verizon has been doing with the FAA under our memorandum of agreement, which you can also, you know, Google Verizon Skyward memorandum of agreement with FAA, where we're working to characterize um, how cellular network can serve the C2 link. But those are the only initiatives that I'm aware of. Barbara, I think Thank you're you. on mute. Yeah. Yes, apologies for that. So thank you very much for this one. We are at the top of the hour, so I just want to um, to let you know that all uh, the session has been recorded, so we will be providing the this, the recording later on. Uh, but if you have any questions, you can contact us. Um, we will reach out. Akarina give you the emails, but if you also can contact Francesca in LinkedIn, if not, please contact us. We would be able to put you in touch. And also, if you go to our website, we have a lot of these resources that also be mentioned, the work that is ongoing. And if you want to know more, please uh, follow us. Uh, so you, we will be providing you with the information. With this one, I would really want to thank all of you, all the speakers particularly. It's been a great session from my point of view also. Uh, from the diversity point of view, is the first session with all female, <laughs> which uh, we are the, let's say, I consider them the experts in this area. So it's very good to have you all here. And I hope to see you for the next time. So watch out this space because we will have other session coming. Thank you very much. And with this one, I would like to close it. Thanks again. See you soon. Thanks.